We're thrilled to have you back to this our show, Human Humane Architecture on this Think Tech Hawaii. This is the 274th show. And Eric, the, the, the accumulated viewership is as of this moment. Currently, Humane Architecture's got 14,751 views. All right. And it's, co of course, not about quantity, but quality. And that being said, we're back on volume 11 with you, Matt. Uh, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be here. At uh, your Boston base, giving us the Banish boost that we desperately need, we think. And uh, we are three Glatzköpfe von der Tankstelle, which means the three bald guys from the gas station. It's only <laughs> two of us, me, Martin Despang, from the bathroom of its Waikiki Grant. But we're going to have the third one, the Soto Brown, in his Bishop Museum, once he's out of the traffic on H1, which he said will be in supposedly five minutes. So let's get started and talk about him while he's not here, Matt. First slide up, Eric, fast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, we go back to uh, show quoting at the, at the top because we were arguing with, uh, with DeSoto last time after the show because shame on me, I'm always having pinned. <laughs> Uh, the, the picture on Zoom where what the audience sees. So I did not see that he was joining us uh, secretly and quietly. And so I never was aware of that. So he never joined. But this time this will not happen again. And then he said uh, that he watched the show and he said it went shockingly well without him. And Matt, we respectfully disagree with that, right? I, that was went shockingly ba badly without him, I would say. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We can say all this because he isn't here either again. <laughs> and we also need him because at the top right, we're zooming in uh, because um, he has been on this island, which we say we can learn a lot from your practices for the longest, and then you second longest and me the shortest. But he has also experience in that tempered in the cold. And that's why you see him there as bundled up in on that white stuff in his youth. Exactly. There's cute little DeSoto. <laughs> and then, Eric, if you can go to the very left, because he keeps <laughs> saying, OK, I will never go back to this cold. I can't handle it. So at the very top left is what he was happy to return to. There he is, even cuter. And he wears these hats that we talked about on the right, that uh, DeSoto's former Bishop Museum colleague, Jim, who runs this, I said antique, which is probably not what he likes to hear. We should call it vintage store of yeah. things in uh, the uh, Royal Hawaiian Hotel, which architecturally is not unsimilar to what brings us back to your project, which is the Harvard School of Engineering, because these buildings down there look very much similar to the to the Royal Hawaiian. They're stereotomic and they have, you know, a few punched openings into it, mm -hmm. which um, we said in the case of the Royal Hawaiian in some sort of interesting way works here as well. Because usually when they import architecture from elsewhere, it doesn't work that well <laughs> equally especially not when it's all glass buildings that in boston at this time probably helps with passive solar but that thing doesn't exist here mm -hmm. so anyway so tell us about the, the 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 context the situation for the project that we see down there matt well i think that we we sort of introduced the idea of the uh, competition that um through which the original project was awarded ultimately to us um but there was some uh, there was a lot of let's almost call it baggage or context that came with the idea of building such a an important um sort of new structure on harvard's campus which um really at the time um there had been a couple of years since harvard had developed major new parts of their campus and um they were expanding the campus to the other side of the Charles River to the south, the southern banks of the Charles River. The the business school was there already, of course, but this was a lot of land that they were considering um, expanding the campus onto. And there was always the question, you know, that we were being asked to answer: Well, what is Harvard architecturally from the perspective of landscape and 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 physically? And so we were um, 
this is just an image of the uh, classic heart, the, the sort of the central Harvard yard around which all the freshmen uh, eat and sleep uh, during their first year at, at Harvard. And that's kind of the quintessential Harvard experience. And um, a big preoccupation of those early days of the design efforts were what will be the what, what, what how will Harvard be defined in a, on its 21st century campus? Yeah. And again, these trees look naked, and they are because yeah. this is deciduous <laughs> and this is temperate climate. So that's starting to get winter or starting to be spring or one or the other. So that's the situation we're basically facing here, the, the context. And let's jump into the project uh, with the next slide, which once again shows a compilation of sort of multi-duty ways you guys work in sort of, you know, multimedia uh, ways and, yeah, explain what's behind what we see. Yeah, so this is the original competition winning entry for the for the project, which was basically, it was a, it was a almost square site, as you can see, although it, a couple of the sides bend a little bit. It was a sort of funny shape. And um, the idea for the project originally was to build uh, sort of build a basement exactly that shape going down into the ground that was contiguous across the whole site uh, and then above grade to build a series of buildings in this case four buildings um, each of them with um, mostly life sciences research programmed into it that would be obviously connected through the basements everywhere uh, and then connected above grade by a series of um, multi-story pedestrian sort of open air pedestrian walkways that would allow people to move back and forth and where the point where those pedestrian walkways met the the buildings um, were these winter garden spaces that really were in our mind if you see that sketch in the upper left kind of the the idea of this courtyard that the buildings form sort of turning vertically and going up inside the buildings so this was in a sense at a very at a, it's at a somewhat smaller scale our response to the Harvard Yard, which is still to create a kind of an outdoor public space, something that everyone could participate in, uh, but then use that to inform the architecture perhaps more than it is um, actually on, at the old at the old Harvard Yard campus, but still very much um, in in that kind of spatial and community spirit. Yeah. And let's look at these interstitial spaces a little closer in the next slide because this uh, view of the, as you just said, the competition model is a little, little better here. It's interesting for me to look at the buildings themselves. They look very sort of rationalist. Uh, um, Meinert von Gerkan just passed away, right? Uh, and so yes. it, it, it almost looks gerkan <clears throat> in some ways here or Unger's like, and then, yeah. uh, and then what it, on the inside, it really breaks open and free, right? Is that? So interesting, it's, in, it's a lot more interesting to think about this as a sort of a, a, way, a, a, a station stop in the process of getting to the final design that we'll, we'll eventually get to here. Uh, because, you know, also, it, you know, bundled up with this concern about what should the new Harvard be and how is it going to be, how is the new Harvard Yard going to emerge in Alston, uh, was this was a really sort of inbuilt conservatism about <clears throat> that, what the outward looking side of the buildings should really be. And and uh, at, the, at that time, this is directly across the street from the business school, which is a very conservative uh, environment. There was kind of a thought that you know, from the outside to the the the, the street facing parts of these buildings, um, it should be more of a sort of a stone facade with a kind of a gridded appearance. And um, still, these were larger than average windows, and this was a very high performing facade. And we actually we actually sort of subverted it a little bit because we made all the stone panels have um, operable parts. They, the the stone parts were the parts that moved to naturally ventilate the spaces, but. Um, then if we sort of if, if we said that was the, the approach to the outside on the inside, we could sort of go a little bit more crazy and define a whole different environment. So we always sort of joke that, you know, at one point the the gridded facade sort of turns towards the inside and it just gets kind of swallowed up almost like if you remember that the scene from the first aliens movie when you know it kind of grabs onto somebody's the guy's face and there's like a an umbilical coming off of it that was almost the image we had of this thing and that's kind of how it looked actually um yeah in principle 
<clears throat> reminds me a lot of the founding father Günther's um, case of the Pariser Platz in, in Berlin, mm -hmm. where, you know, by Stimmann, the, the big, the, you know, the head of the building department, zoning department, uh, basically assigned, prescribed the old style pre-war for the whole city. Mm -hmm. And then um, it was basically two guys who didn't behave and <clears throat> one was Gunter and the other one was, this reminds me of, was Gary, mm -hmm. uh, who was behaving on the outside and then freaking out on the inside with his big fish. Yeah. Yeah. And Gunter yeah, basically I... said, I'm, I'm not even, you know, doing it on the outside and fought it through with, with a museum there, right? So yeah. this is, yeah. it's a really interesting kind of a thing of, talking you know our psychology and architecture and smuggling in things and smuggling things through and yeah so that's that's great i'm, I'm glad you point this out and there is de soto welcome uh good morning or good day or whatever the heck it is <laughs> i'm finally here but i hardly hardly know where i am it's okay we're gonna slide you in smoothly all right. And I, I'm going to do it this way because um, I, I was uh, same as you and we bad guys. We shouldn't even be in cars on freeways here. But I came back from the poly and both of us don't get it wrong because you just sort of I'm not repeating. You're flipping over from way back, which made you hit the title page of the start advertiser when you were young and your beetle. So we're driving safe. Yes. But I had the chance because uh, usually I'm into uh, Stanley Chang's newsletter right before the show, but I got something even more exciting from you, Matt. <laughs> Explain <laughs> me what that is, what you sent me, which I then eagerly watched right away. Yeah, this is a, an interesting program called uh, Felo VIP, which is a, um, a, a kind of bicycle or a tandem bicycle interview conducted uh, <laughs> on the streets of various cities in in germany and this happened to be an episode of uh my partner stefan with uh with the host there um bicycling around stuttgart <laughs> so so eric give this to we give this to jay as it's just suggestion because isn't it kind of hypocrite to soto we're supposedly the easy breezy show and we're doing it in uh, a frigid mm. museum and then uh, <laughs> with a fan operating interior bathroom here so i think we should and again my my where i have my old bicycle repaired at the macaulay bike shop the the one guy there uh basically we started talking he said oh jay and i go back decades and we were the bicycling pioneers on this island so it should be an easy pitch to you jay right so let's jay, jay i i can't imagine yeah, jay on a yeah. bicycle no no it is not, not the you. not the jay of 2022 yeah no he no. was and so it's uh it's true so Anyway, can, you imagine, so can you imagine how great your show would be if you were bicycling through, you know, Kakako no, and talking about no, this stuff? Ab so. Abs so this is a great idea. And then, you know, this is this is a tandem, but not uh, behind each other, but next pair besides each other, the two people. We, we should throw in some awesome. some screenshots from that for the next show and let me give the yeah, audience more I, of an image. I, of I, it. I, I can't I can't picture it either. Let's I'll, start send you, out I'll, the, send, I'll send you the yeah, link. Uh, yeah, okay. let's. OK, OK, it's entertaining. I was about to send it to you, but usually we, we, we're we fine giving you the, the German learning sentence, and this would be a whole show in German. But you will still I, enjoy it. I, I, I can at least look at it, even if I won't know what they're talking about. Yeah, no, it was it was it was really great, uh, great, great edutainment. And um, for for everyone, either, you know, um, already in the, skilled in the German language or interested in you as you did Soda and everyone else, you should, you should definitely watch it. So it's, yeah, many of the things you're now talking about sort of resonates with me. And, and you said, well, of course you heard parts of the stories, you know, you know, over and over again, mm. but having them all together <laughs> compiled in one piece is, is, is really compelling. So and again, we're at the Soto, we're now at the competition. We talked about how important architectural competitions are for getting the best project out of it last time. And so this is, as Matt just said, this is the competition model that uh, we find out was uh, sort of very uh, sneaky uh, in, in terms of 
trying to um, have uh, not to shock the audience with the Banish boost too much to begin with <laughs> and do this later. So this is this is really cool, you know, um, to have a competition model that's sort of, yeah, sort of. Are, are, are you are you saying that there was subterfuge? Are you saying they're covering things up, which they spring no. on people afterwards or there are hidden things in the model that are not, are not obvious that to, to take a building off and then you discover something underneath it? No, no, it's that, more. It's more about what happens on the interior, like it's that's four what I, around yes, the that's, courtyard. So. Yeah, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Yeah, <laughs> it looks innocent so from, on the outside, but on right, the inside, right. it's it's yeah. Okay. You know, Stefan was saying something really interesting. This this reminds me of when he was asked by the by the showmaster. He said, you know, between the the competitions or the design and the building is finally completed, it takes years. They said like mm -hmm. five to seven years. So usually by the time, I mean, even if architects try to be really hit the spot of zeitgeist, mm -hmm. they always miss it by then because of that reason. <laughs> because t exactly. seven years later, it's already outdated. So it's better to do something that it doesn't even try to be absolutely you know a victim of its time but in best mm -hmm. case being timeless which is hard to and you shouldn't you know be stressing yourself out to do that either but you should just do that what he says what you think needs to be done and that yeah. will be right and it won't be look old and outdated by the way at the solo well, us having to write the book about honolulu the fade and uh, city guide uh, the the one that was and it's out of print now they were saying this about the convention center and yeah. I shared that with with Philip, and he was a little annoyed about his colleagues uh, about such a, uh, an assessment. But that's what they said. You remember they said the convention center was already outdated by the time it was built. And we said we would take a different take on it. We would say, well, it, it really is very ambitious as far as the tectonics and the detailing, butt joint glass and stuff. But it's just wrong in the tropics. I, mm -hmm. That's the way I, we said we would say it, right? Because again, yeah, it, it, no. it is entirely enclosed. Except, yeah. well, they they <clears throat> did. I do. I do have to say they did build the roof to be an air, an area where people could assemble. But as mm -hmm. soon as that was publicized, everybody in the condos around the building said, "Oh no, no, no! You can't have loud. You can't have loud events on the roof, which will bother all of us." Mm -hmm. So that shut down the possibility of having outdoor events at that particular venue so it's not entirely the fault of the architects it's just the yeah. how things turned out yeah mm -hmm. and speaking of which uh you know surrounding and looking at it from around and above that gets us to the next slide because that shows us the condition of the project um as you found it or as you start to be big yeah i mean the the the, the existing this status quo, so to speak, how you found it, right? And another challenge, one of the many challenges it was presenting, right? Right. So that project we were just looking at went on for a couple of years until about 2008, at which point the um, world, whatever they called it at the time, the world financial collapse uh, sort of brought the project to a close or to a, a pause point in Harvard. Um, restructured our contract and asked us to basically cap the site. So that that basement, that five acre deep, five acre uh, wide, sixty foot deep basement, we needed to put a whole roof over it and protect all the openings and kind of basically uh, protect the asset. So that's what you're seeing here. This is probably uh, the least uh, inspirational Banish project that's ever been uh, inflicted on the world. But that was actually the final state of the project from about 2010 until 2013. <laughs> Oh boy. Well, let's get the next slide up and illustrate that going along with that challenge. So, right. Uh, uh, once the project did restart and uh, Harvard had identified new occupants for the building, uh, those new occupants uh, developed a building program with us that looked nothing like the original one. Uh, even to the point that the, the column grid that was assumed to be uh, usable for the below grade portions of the building and the above grade portions of the uh, former design uh, needed to be completely rethought. So what this sketch was basically intimating was, you know, you had a series of columns in an above grade building uh, that wanted to be in one set of dimensions and a series of built columns below grade that were on a completely different um, uh, 
uh, uh, pattern, let's say. And uh, we had to figure out how to bring those two things together uh, right at the ground plane, which was, was quite a, a, an engineering feat. You know, oh and as a, again, as a, as a lay person, I think this points out that the path between the theoretical and the planned to the real thing can have these huge diversions that you can't anticipate. And what you plan for is not necessarily what the building's going to look like. Right, right. Or what it will do in the future, I think, right. uh, it raises lots of questions about, you know, the notion of kind of open, open minded planning and uh, the, the, how, how much a building can allow itself to evolve with uh, new uses and new, new yeah. purposes. And speaking of planning, gets us to the next slide, because here's the plan. <laughs> but why would this be of interest for us? Uh, you, DeSoto, and I, we actually looked at our university, the University of Hawaii Manoa, quite in detail and dedicated multiple shows to that. So when we're saying we're needing your, uh, Matt, your, your, your boost so badly, it's not just us in Hawaii, but this might make us um, thinking <laughs> we might also need that on campus because the sort of, there's some recent developments that make our non-existing hair stand up. <clears throat> uh, in, in, I, I really love, there, there were the five, uh, five questions at the end of the, the VIP velo. Mm -hmm. with Stefan and one mm -hmm. of them was like um, okay you know a building uh, renovated or or built new and right. he immediately said you know rebuild whatever it yeah. takes yeah. and that's what they we because I work for this institution the University of Hawaii in Manoa do totally wrong they're tearing down in fact uh, not some you know buildings that you might be sick of but actually some modern master marvels and replace it with things without any competitions and in in a way that we don't think this is per your my favorite of your shows one of your one of your you know talks to soto the tradition of uh, innovation and the evolution of the tradition of innovation. So just keep this in mind when we go through this here, the audience, this might be very educational for us up on the educational hill in Manoa. So the plan, explain us more, the color. So what color. You're, yeah, so what you're, what you're looking at here is actually a plan of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences which was the ultimate occupant of our project in, in Alston. Uh, this is where they occupied space in Cambridge up until uh, basically 2021 when they moved over into the new building. And so you can see that just in terms of the sort of the extents of the spaces they occupied and the, uh, and, and I can just tell you that everything in orange here, the quality of the space in most of those buildings was uh, very, very poor. They weren't necessarily in many cases designed as research buildings. Uh, that was, there was very, um, it was very suboptimal space. There wasn't enough of it. And what we were essentially trying to illustrate here is you can see the red dashed outline of the new site in Alston, uh, how much more compact uh, they would be able to be uh, accommodated in a new um, in a new building configuration that was more, that brought everything more together. So um, that's really what this was, was about, was the, was the organization of seeds in Cambridge along Oxford Street. Yeah, and speaking of organization gets us to the next chart, which is labeled program <laughs> diagram. And on behalf of you guys, and he was actually speaking on behalf of you because he was saying, well, the most work in educational design we're having uh, in the United States with our Boston firm, which you're heading. Mm -hmm. And he also mentioned these as, as the first typologies when he was asked about, you know, what he's all doing, what you guys are all doing. And he explained, he says, because it's so exciting because you're working with creative minds and people who never mind what we just said about you age, but mm -hmm. <laughs> <you know. laughs> um, potentially there too. I don't give up the hope on my employer. Uh, so easily um, is is to work with all these eager people who want to you know work for a better future. So work with them. But that being said, you know that also then comes with quite um, uh, you know a complicated way because they're all meaning well, but there's many who have a saying and want something. So to 
synthesize that might be might be quite the quite the challenge, right? Which this uh, diagram that you know will tell us more about just gives us a clue, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, this is basically. I mean, to sort of sum this up, this is a graphic representation of the the room program for the building and it basically breaks down into three components about a third each uh the first being obviously research facilities so wet and dry research laboratories for um for things as diverse as uh, bioengineering robotics soft materials research mechanics um and computer science uh, and then the second third of the program is uh, teaching facilities. So all of the teaching efforts of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences moved to Alston. And so we have a whole uh, complement of classrooms, uh, teaching re- sort of teaching laboratory spaces and, and, and things of that nature, seminar rooms and group study spaces and so on and so forth. Uh, and then the final third is really amenity spaces uh, that are constituted by the, the science library, the cafeteria um, that serves the whole the whole building, um, conferencing spaces, uh, and and things of that nature. So um, altogether, it's a very diverse program, but one that um, you know, as you said, it, it, it's it, it, a program this diverse really gives us a chance, in a way, to step out of our own daily existence as architects, and and kind of live vicariously through our clients, right? Like how we 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 get. A chance in our in our work to be you know to be researchers or pseudo researchers for a couple of years or to be lawyers or to be uh you know doctors or whatever because we have to know so much about what they do that we really have to almost get in their shoes for a little bit to understand it all right well great closing note because it has to be because we're at the end of another exciting 28 minutes and we see you again (laughs) but not before the new year because this is the concluding show in the year and uh so we will see each other back the three of us and you the audience will see each other back well you will see it on the fifth and we will be together on the fourth and until then, uh, you can go back to the World Cup, which we see behind you, Matt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we also let you go into some happy holidays. Uh, let them be peaceful in the world, first and foremost, and pleasant along with that. So happy holidays for all you guys. Thanks for your loyalty, having watched us. And we look forward to see you again in the fresh new year. Yes, likewise. Take care, uh-huh. gentlemen. Hello, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.